So I'd like to, to cover case control and cohort studies. I won't talk about to, to a large degree about the, the design issues involved in these because I realize I'm you know it's sort of preaching to the choir, I'm talking to a group of epidemiologists, but we'll make a couple of comments about that. And then candidate gene studies, genome-wide association, and a little bit about randomized and experimental designs. Uh, you may have seen this um, that came from Francis Collins in Nature of 2004. Um, this was actually shortly after we had started working together. He had asked me to, to come over and just help out with a workshop they wanted to have on the possibility of maybe doing a, a very large, and when genomicists say very large, you know, they, remember they think in terms of three billion base pairs. Um, so he was thinking of a 500,000 person cohort study of genes and environment. Um, this, uh, this piece came out after a, a, a year-long uh, effort to sort of map out what such, such a study might look like. And, um, and a panel of experts that we had brought together uh, recommended that obviously a study would need to be large because you want to capture uh, lots of different diseases in, in the diversity of the U.S. population. You want to, to fully represent um, the, the uh, U.S. minority groups, have a broad a range of ages, broad ranges of genetic backgrounds and environmental exposures. Um, you probably want to have some family-based recruitment for at least part of the study um, to account for population stratification that Tom will be talking about tomorrow. Lots of data to be collected on these people if you go to all the trouble of, of, of recruiting them. Um, you'd want to have very technologically advanced measures. You'd want to collect and store biologic specimens. You'd need a sophisticated data management system, a whole, a whole number of things um, that, that were sort of recommended as the, you know, the next big cohort study, big, big, big cohort study, as it were. And, and this received sort of a, a variable response. Um, this is another Gary Larson. Now, stay calm. Let's hear what they said to Bill. So um, there were those who said this would cost way too much, it was way too big, it wasn't necessary, it was already being done, there, you know, a variety of responses that one often gets. And we, we then went back and, and sort of tried to lay out um, in more detail what some of the problems are with case control studies, because particularly in the genetics literature, this is, has been, you know, really the darling of, of this, uh, of the approach, um, primarily because it's easy, uh, you know, it's, uh, people think it's easy. It's, it's hard to do well, but it's, uh, it's easy to collect cases and, and compare them to, uh, to a bunch of controls. Um, and then there was this, this kind of back and forth with Walt Willett's group um, suggesting that, well, if we needed to come up with a new cohort study because we all recognize the strengths of cohorts, maybe we could just merge the cohorts we have rather than come up with a, an entirely new one. And we were asked to kind of write, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a point counterpoint to that, saying, yes, that's all, that's all well and good, but if you were to do that, you would end up with studies that were kind of a conglomeration of existing cohorts, recognizing that the, just a simple uh, um, uh, example, the age distribution of existing cohorts, which is shown here um, in a survey that we had done of, of uh, cohorts in preparation for, for uh, uh, this planning process, uh, did not at all approximate the age distribution of the U.S. population, which is shown here uh, according to the U.S. Census. Um, and a variety of other things that, that would be shortcomings of, of uh, existing cohorts, recognizing that there are many strengths and we should, should make use of those strengths, but in addition should also do a large cohort study. Um, and we've talked to a fair amount with, with geneticists about the pros and cons of case control studies. Recommend, uh, recognizing that a, a major strength um, of them is that the, it's probably the only way to study rare diseases or those of long latency. Again, not, not something I need to emphasize with, with this audience. Existing records can be used. You can co um, study multiple etiologic factors simultaneously. Uh, they may be and often are less time consuming, often they're uh, less costly. And if the assumptions are met, the inferences are, are reliable. And then one, one tries to sort of communicate, but there are some real challenges with these. You're relying on recall or records for information on past exposures. It's very difficult to validate that information at times. Selecting the appropriate comparison group can be difficult, and no matter what group you select, uh, reviewers or, or colleagues or, or uh, competitors will criticize it. Um, multiple biases can give spurious evidence of an association. You usually can't study rare exposures, and temporal relationships between exposures and disease can be very difficult to, to define. So when I, I tell these things to my genetics colleagues, they say, but this is genetics, you dumb epidemiologist. This is different. Um, genes are measured the same way in the cases and controls. Not a problem. So information on the key exposure is really very easy to validate. There's no recall or reporting involved. And the temporal relationship, the genes were present since conception. So, you know, that's a piece of cake. Uh, and my response to that is also often that bias-free ascertainment of cases and controls is still a major concern. Um, and we'll talk more about, about some, Tom will, especially about the, some of the biases involved in, collect, in collecting these. And cases in most clinical series are, are highly unlikely to be representative. 
and that assessment of risk modifiers or gene environment interactions is, is highly likely in a case control study to be incomplete or flawed uh, for a variety of reasons. And so, so we go back and forth on this, and as you can imagine, uh, sometimes being the only epidemiologist in the room, it's, it's a challenge. That's why it's been nice having, having Tom around. So, so weaknesses of appreciating weaknesses of case control studies, I think at, at times epidemiologists uh, tend, to, tend to view them as, as this Larson cartoon, the monster climbing in the window, where the geneticists tend to view us as, as kind of chicken little, you know, complaining that the sky is falling and, and you know, can't, can't we look at the, some of the successes that there have been, and there have been some major successes in this area. And probably the truth lies somewhere in between, and we need to be sure we, we use both, uh, uh, both designs but recognize their, their weaknesses. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about candidate genes, especially in this, uh, in this uh, election year. Um, genetic studies prior to uh, 2005 were almost exclusively this kind of work, candidate gene work. Uh, the goal was to characterize what we would call a candidate based on, on what we might know about the, genetic, uh, uh, the, the biologic pathway, the genetic mechanism, et cetera, what might be related to the disease. Usually these kinds of studies weren't uh, intended to find genes or find variants related to disease as linkage studies were. Linkage studies, you set up all those signposts across the genome and you try to figure out which of the signposts seems to be inherited with the disease and then maybe something near the signpost is related to, to uh, is, is a variant related to disease. But these were generally done after the, the potentially disease-related variants were identified. Um, one could assess generalizability of, of observations in, in families, family-based uh, observations, such as the BRCA1 variants, which, which showed very, very strong um, uh, influence and risk in, in uh, Ashkenazi Jews, but much less of, a, of an effect and, and much lower prevalence in, uh, in other groups. Uh, assess the importance of allelic variation at the population level. Again, uh, population attributable risk, penetrance, the geneticists often call it, which is the likelihood that, it, that the gene will be expressed or the disease will be present in someone who carries a, uh, a particular variant. And then identifying modifications of genetic associations by environmental factors. So these are all the sort of things that, that population-based epidemiologists would tend to do with candidate genes. One of the, the first and, and perhaps best characterized of candidate gene studies was the angiotensin converting enzyme um, uh, variants. Um, the, the ACE um, uh, enzyme had been identified long ago. Um, this is just from a textbook, but this was probably in Guyton's um, uh, work long ago. Uh, in terms of the pathway that leads to um, increased uh, uh, blood pressure and, and vasoconstriction. And the gene was identified through a, a variety of very elegant steps which, that were very difficult at the time, 1989, uh, 1991, et cetera, linked to elevated blood pressures and, and rat models, et cetera, and then finally mapped to the human chromosome 17 by Jean Metre, and then um, um, also showed to be associated with uh, levels of, of ACE, the, the ACE enzyme levels, which is very nice. If you think you found your gene, you would like to see that it's associated with differences in levels. And as you can see, this was an insertion deletion polymorphism. Tom mentioned in Dell's before. Uh, there was a, a small segment of, of uh, uh, DNA that was either present or um, deleted uh, in, in um, carriers of, of this variant. Uh, and it was found through RFLP analysis. Um, and again, this is the 250 base pair um, uh, insertion. And people who were homozygous for the insertion had higher, sorry, had lower uh, ACE levels than those who were heterozygous and, and much lower than those who were homozygous for the deletion. And this is true on a log scale as well. What really sort of shook, shook the, the world was this Cambien paper, and, and some of you may remember when this came out. Um, this was, was typed actually in a prospective study, the ECTIM study. I've forgotten what it stands for. Uh, it may be on one of these slides, but at any rate, um, identifying this particular deletion polymorphism as a potent risk factor for myocardial infarction um, from this French group. Um, and what they showed was that uh, in 1,304 MI cases and a, and a group of matched controls, uh, sorry, this is the, the total number of ca cases and controls, that um, those with a DD polymorphism uh, had somewhat greater risk. The, the insertion deletion um, uh, heterozygotes um, had a, uh, sorry, a lower risk, and, and those with the uh, insertion polymorphism was uh, basically not changed. This was a relatively weak association, um, although it was significant given the numbers that they studied. Um, but when they stratified on low risk versus high risk, this association really came out, and people who uh, were homozygous for the deletion had a much higher risk, an odds ratio of three, versus those who, who um, were heterozygous or, or carried the, the homozygous uh, insertion. Um, and those who, who were already at high risk based on other cardiovascular risk factors really didn't seem to have uh, much association with this polymorphism. 
Um, so this caused lots of excitement. Many, many uh, prospective studies rushed to try to replicate this finding. Uh, not many were able to do so. Um, and, and in fact, in, the, in hypertension, the, you'd see papers come out like this, uh, my colleague Chris O'Donnell from Framingham, uh, showing an association with the DD polymorphism in hypertension, for example, um, with a reasonable uh, uh, association, but really nothing in women, um, a lot of times inconsistencies, and, and it really wasn't clear sort of what, what was going on with this. Well, what was, what was probably going on with it was, uh, was perhaps a spurious association, um, uh, an association that seemed to make sense that was found in one study that, that uh, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, luck or lack of luck or whatever, um, uh, identified it, but then when we tried to replicate it, it was not uh, found subsequently. Um, and actually, uh, Hirshhorn did a, did a very nice review of this issue in, in 2002 in Genetics and Medicine, showing the number of association studies that really started to take off as the genotyping technology got better and as we identified more and more polymorphisms, and you had this huge peak. Um, and this, this pr pretty much continued on up. It's, it's leveled off a little bit uh, into 2002. And yet of the 600 papers that, uh, that they identified um, that had, had reported an association in, in more than two or three studies, I believe, only six, so 1% of them, um, were, were significantly associated in more than three quarters of the identified studies. One of them is, is near and dear to, to us in cardiovascular epidemiology, the factor V Leiden variant with uh, deep venous thrombosis. Um, there are a couple of others here. The APOE is one of the strongest associations uh, that's, that's ever been found uh, with Alzheimer's disease. But these were the only six, really, that, that came out um, as, as being robust and, and replicated. We did a similar sort of exercise in uh, carotid atherosclerosis, basically took all of the variants that had been reported somewhere as being associated with uh, coronary artery disease and said, well, we recognize that coronary disease is sort of a distal phenotype, and there are many things that lead to coronary disease. One of them is atherosclerosis. That may be a little bit closer to the genetic you know, product, whatever it might be, and so perhaps as kind of an intermediate phenotype or a more objective measure, it would be something that, that would show a stronger association. And actually, when we looked at that with a variety of, of variants, you notice the ACE insertion deletion. There were 13 that showed an 13 studies showed an association. One of them showed it with the, the different allele. Uh, 18 showed no association. So the summary uh, sort of favored none, and many favored no association. And many of the these variants then that had the strongest evidence initially really, you know, pretty much were equivocal. The only one that kind of came out was the MMP3 uh, matrix metalloproteinase 3 probably because there were only four studies at the time we did this review um, that had looked at it. And as it, as it was looked at more, it sort of dropped out as well. So candidate gene studies were not um, terribly um, uh, fruitful. The initial enthusiasm has been markedly damped by failure to replicate findings. Um, and the, the point has been made that you can probably find a study or a story or some kind of a biologic pathway that will fit almost any candidate to almost any disease or trait. Um, and understanding of the genome function is, was just too preliminary at this point to project more than really a handful of plausible candidates. I would point out that the APOE was never in a million years thought to be related to Alzheimer's disease. I mean, that was in a, in a way a fluke finding. It was found in a linkage study, um, but it was incredibly strong. It was replicated again and again and again and again, um, and now we have some really good pathophysiologic reason for that to, to be there. So it, this wasn't a fruitless uh, effort, but it came up with a lot of false positives. So a paradigm change was needed, much like these fellows are having here. Hey, they're lighting their arrows. Can they do that? Um, and we needed perhaps to burn the barn down a little bit. And the, and the way we, we did that was, as we talked about um, uh, last time and Tom has mentioned, through genome-wide association studies. So here's a karyogram with all the various bands of the, of the genome show, shown here. These bands tend to sustain. They're just GC-rich regions. If you're interested in cytogenetics, there are people who spend entire careers doing this kind of work. But in 2005, we had basically no genes for um, uh, common diseases, common complex diseases. And we refer to complex diseases as the ones that, you know, you, you had hoped were single gene Mendelian, but you didn't find the Mendelian gene, so it must be complex. But at any rate, um, in 2005, there was one variant identified for complex disease. It was here on chromosome 1 for complement factor H in age-related macular degeneration. Uh, in 2006, um, there were two, uh, two others, both on chromosome 1 uh, for QT interval. Um, and, sorry, QT interval is down here, and um, inflammatory bowel disease, and then another on chromosome 10 for age-related macular degeneration. 2007 really was the, the year of genome-wide association studies. We've sort of broken it up into quarters, and just to kind of page through this, the second quarter was incredibly pr productive. Several studies simultaneously in prostate, prostate cancer, breast cancer, diabetes, the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, all kinds of findings, all of them replicating, really very, very exciting third quarter, fourth quarter, and then just the first quarter of 2008. 
So, so this has been really an incredible progression. I think uh, um, when genome-wide association started, there was a prediction that you know within five years we'd have identified you know five variants for for maybe ten diseases, and and we've done far better, better than that. So 2007 was sort of dubbed the year of genome-wide association studies. Um, this was science, I believe, that dubbed it its, its breakthrough of the year, was that measures of, of human genetic variation made possible through the HapMap and, and similar kinds of, kinds of genetic tools. And just the, the number of studies in, in our catalog, which I'd encourage you to look at and, and, you know, let us know if there are ways you think it can be improved or, or things that you find wrong with it or, or whatever. Um, but there have been 53 traits now that have had published genome-wide studies, uh, some of them in, in things you wouldn't think would be, you know, of, of particular uh, public health importance, although, although many are. Restless legs is one that's often, often identified as, as, gee, why do we have genome-wide studies of that and we don't have it of, you know, fetal malformations and, and that. Um, and if you've ever dealt with somebody who has restless leg syndrome, it's actually a, a very common and, and very troublesome um, uh, kind of condition, so. Um, and here's our catalog here, so just to give you sort of a, a screenshot of it, if you Google um, GWAS catalog, I think it comes right up. Um, and these are the, the pieces of information that we're pulling out. We, we decided we had to track this anyway for, for some work that we were doing, and we thought maybe, you know, in, the, in sort of the genome way, we would make this uh, information available to the scientific community. So we, we um, uh, collect all of this information. The stuff in, in white uh, is, is kind of the easy stuff to pull out. It's the things in blue, the gene region, the genes uh, that are, are in that region, the strongest SNP and the risk allele, risk allele frequencies, p-values and odds ratios are a little bit harder to pull out and we want to be sure that that information is right. So it, it tends to lag a little bit. We'll, we'll identify a study and then say this stuff is pending. And, We've kind of committed to doing this through the end of 2008, and if we're, we're all still standing at that time, we may continue, we may not. Um, but, and then this is just an example of sort of the full catalog, and it shows you disease trait, replication sample size, region gene, strongest SNP, et cetera. Uh, some studies had more than one SNP identified, and we tried to show them there. We kind of picked the top five uh, just as a starting point, and we may try to go back and pull out more of those. And we tended to pull out the top five sort of new ones. So this isn't a real good resource for telling what's been replicated, and, and that's been a criticism and one we're trying to address. Okay. I'm just curious, uh, uh, you know, for the strongest one, uh, strongest, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, I mean, yep. identify a lot of the, uh, the genes and so on. Uh, I wonder what percent of... Uh, oh. of what percent of variation actually that's explained by by these? Uh, right. So, the, so your question is the, for the strongest risk allele um, or risk alleles. What percent of variation? Or, or alleles. I mean, the, yeah. you 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 identify a bunch of them. I mean, right. Uh, the, yeah, and it's very small. It's probably less than five percent of the of the genetic variation. Totally. I, mean, I, I showed you a couple of examples where the authors are saying that it's explaining more, and I'm you know I question that, um, but it's it's very little, five ten percent at, at most. Um, so. Yeah, often, often it's not. No, yeah, there's no sort of no estimate. So, so as I say, we'll we'll uh, do this as long as we hold out. So, anyway, um, and then just to to remind folks what a genome-wide association study is. It's a way of interrogating all 10 million variable points across the genome, recognizing that since it's inherited, the variation is inherited in groups. You don't have to test everything. All, all 10 million points, you can uh, test just a few of them, 300,000 to 100,000, uh, for example. And what one could do, uh, taking the Samani study from New England Journal of uh, coronary disease, uh, just the, they're most strongly associated, and when I say strong, I'm coming from the genome world, which is actually the p-value, so we're talking about the significance level. And these folks calculate significance levels to three digits, I mean three digits on the exponent, so, you know, 10 to the minus hundredth. Um, when I was a baby epidemiologist, they taught us, you know, nothing less than 10, point, uh, 10 to the minus fourth was even worth reporting. You just report those all as .0001 and move on, um, but times have changed. So, uh, they're, so their SNP with the highest p-value uh, that, that sort of uh, survived replication, et cetera, uh, was this one. I was taught by a friend that I found something very useful was just to sort of look for SNPs by their last, their last four. You know, you get asked your last four, your social security number and that. Um, so I, I know this one fondly as 3049, but at any rate, um, you find it, it's, it's very easy when you're looking through papers and trying to find these things. Um, and what the 3049 um, uh, C allele was found in 55 percent of the cases, only 47 percent of the controls, and the G allele, uh, conversely, uh, giving an allelic odds ratio, that is, for carrying the allele, either one or two copies, doesn't matter, just what's, what's the, the uh, allelic odds ratio, 1.4, uh, very high chi-square um, and, a, and a, a very small p-value associated with that. 
One can also look at, at the three genotypes. So you could either say, do you have C or, or not? Or you can say, are you a CC, CG, or GG? And in this study, again, 31% of the cases were the CC uh, genotype versus 23% of the controls. And then conversely, in the GG uh, genotypes, a uh, very high uh, chi-square now with two degrees of freedom because you have three risk groups, 10 to the minus 14th. You can calculate a heterozygote odds ratio, which would be the risk of the, the heterozygote group to the uh, ancestral allele, uh, and a homozygote odds ratio, uh, the risk of the, the homozygote uh, variant to the ancestral allele. I might mention we've kind of gotten away from the terms uh, wild type and, and uh, mutant um, wild type because uh, one, could, one could imagine, you know, Martha and, and George sitting in their doctor's office and the doctor saying, you know, George, you have the, the wild type of such and such, and Martha saying, I never knew you were such a wild type myself. Um, but at any rate, uh, and mutant because it carries certain connotations. And so we, we prefer to, to refer to either the ancestral or, or common allele and the, the um, uh, variant allele. And what one does then is just calculate these, all of these um, uh, chi-square values or whatever association statistic you have, have across all of your SNPs, so you know, 300,000, 500,000 times. And as I, I may have mentioned earlier, because DNA is a linear molecule, you can just start with the, the P end of chromosome one. P, remember the chromosomes have two arms. Uh, P is the part above the, the centromere. It's usually smaller than the part below the centromere. P is, it's, these were named by the French, so P for petite, and then Q for the, uh, for the long arm. Uh, but anyway, you just kind of line these up, and here are your, your P values. In this particular study by Beirut, they've just uh, uh, plotted P values uh, across the genome. Um, and you can plot them in many different ways. This one, as I mentioned before, the negative log of the, of the p-value. This is the Klein study of macular degeneration, which sort of really got this whole field going uh, in, in March of 2005. Um, and here's, you know, another somewhat more colorful way, even more col colorful way of plotting them. You can, you can plot them, you know, multiple studies on a single, um, uh, a single page. In fact, the Wellcome Trust, I think, was a, I don't know, a, a $15 million um, uh, exercise, and this has been called the $15 million plot. So at any rate, uh, and as Tom mentioned, um, this, this sort of deluge of, of data, not only just data, but also positive findings has, has been um, uh, alluded to drinking from a fire hose. Uh, David Hunter and Peter Kraft at Harvard wrote this very nice um, uh, summary on statistical issues in genome-wide association studies. And, oops, and they conclude that there have been few, if any, similar bursts of discovery in the history of medical research. And I think that's, that's probably true over this short a period of time. Lessons that we've learned from kind of the initial burst of, of genome-wide association studies, probably the biggest lesson has been we, we really don't know much about disease pathophysiology or, or um, uh, biologic pathways. And these are um, just a, a few of the signals in, in genes that nobody would have suspected as, as being related to uh, these particular diseases. Macular degeneration I already mentioned um, related to complement factor H, which is part of the inflammatory pathway. Um, uh, macular degeneration was thought to be an ischemic disease uh, until, until this finding. Coronary disease related to CDKN2A and 2B. These are cell cycle variants that actually are related to cancer, wouldn't have been on anybody's candidate gene list. Childhood asthma related to RMDL3, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit more. Type 2 diabetes with a, another cell cycle variant. QT interval prolongation, Tom mentioned, um, uh, related to a, a, a nitric oxide synthase variant. There have been a number of variants found in places where there really aren't any genes at all. And in the past, when linkage signals were found in these areas, they were discounted. People were like, just like finding linkage signals in introns. People said, oh, that can't be right, or it must be a false positive. We know there are lots of those and, and that. Um, but the, the 8Q24 um, association in particular has been found over and over and over and over again. Um, and it's, you know, it's there. It's not going to go away. And, and it really is going to change our understanding of the biology of the genome to understand how you know, a variant in a place that doesn't have anything to do with protein coding is, is so um, uh, related to cancer. How Crohn's disease uh, has several uh, vari uh, variants that strongly replicated that are in areas without any no gene, known genes. Uh, and then signals in, in common across diseases, so diseases that people would not have thought were, were quite too terribly related. Maybe diabetes and CHD, you might have thought were, but even when you control for diabetes as a risk factor for CHD, these associations remain. Um, these variants, as I mentioned, are related to cancer, uh, particularly familial invasive melanoma. Um, again, not something that one would have, have expected. They're also associated with frailty in a study from the UK. Prostate cancer, breast and colorectal cancer are all associated with this 8Q24 uh, region. Crohn's disease and psoriasis do have some, some um, um, uh, 
characteristics in common, so maybe that's not a big surprise, but I think Crohn's disease and type 1 diabetes were never expected to be related any more than, than just in the, the immune um, um, signal, the major histocompatibility complex where they do share a locus, but they also share one in this phosphatase, PTPN2, rheumatoid arthritis, and, and type 1 diabetes in, in another uh, phosphatase. So lots of new things learned from these kinds of studies that, that really are in many ways kind of setting biology on its ear. Unique aspects of these studies are that they permit an examination of vari variability really at an unprecedented level of resolution. So much, you know, down to the 5 to 10 kb region or even, uh, even uh, tighter than that. As Tom has mentioned a couple of times, they permit sort of an agnostic genome-wide interrogation, so you don't have to, to be able to identify your, your candidate genes, the places you want to look. One of the nice things about this is that once you've measured the genome, you can relate it to just about any trait. So, so once you have your genome-wide association study, if you have a cohort study or a group that's been characterized in, in, um, in extensive ways, you can then relate those things to, to anything. Whereas, whereas with candidate gene studies, you sort of had a separate set of candidate genes for each trait. And as I mentioned, most of the robust associations have not been in genes previously suspected of association and not in regions even uh, known to harbor genes. Um, but as Hunter and Kraft point out, the chief strength of the new approach is also its chief problem. With more than 500,000 comparisons, the potential for false positives really is unprecedented. So we were worried about false positives with candidate genes. Here, you know, it's, it's really a huge, huge, huge problem. Um, and again, Gary Larson knew this and said, uh, God, Collings, I hate to start a Monday with a case like this. And here you see this knife sticking out of the back and the Butlers of the World Annual Convention. So the challenge is, how do you find, you know, the murderer from, from all of these uh, uh, false positives? And there are a number of ways of dealing with this multiple testing problem. Probably the most familiar, the, the easiest to grasp, and the one most commonly used is the Bonferrani correction, just simply dividing your, your alpha level by the number of tests performed. Uh, there are a couple of others that, that have been in the literature that probably the second most common would be the false discovery rate, um, which is the proportion of significant associations that are truly false positive, so it gives you a different denominator. The false positive report probability of Sholem Wachelder at, uh, at the NCI, um, uh, probability that the null hypothesis is true given a significant finding. Um, logically, I don't see much of a difference between these two, at least in the way they're described by their authors, but they are different mat mathematically and are, are said to, to give you somewhat different results. Um, but probably the best approach is, is replication of a finding, and replication many, many, many times. So in order to address this, um, we recognized that there was a, a need to define sort of what replication consisted of. This is a report from a, an NCI NHGRI working group that was uh, convened in November 2006. Um, and yeah. um, and the, this, uh, there are a number of ways of, of going about um, uh, replication. This is a, sort of the design of a study to do replication given an initial study and wanting to have sort of your replication sets all lined up. So, so this was proposed by the, the group who were studying prostate cancer at the NCI, uh, Bob Hoover may be a, a name that some of you recognize. They were going to start with 1,200 cases and 1,200 controls, but test as, you know, 500,000 tag SNPs, so, so using the Illumina platform, um, uh, a very uh, wide, a dense uh, uh, genome array. Then in their replication study, they were going to actually expand the number of cases and controls that they did um, and do a smaller number, but still a fairly significant, a fairly large number of, of SNPs, about 5% of them in, a, in their first replication study. Their second replication study, uh, almost similar number of cases and controls, but a smaller number of SNPs, and you notice this funnel kind of narrowing down in their third replication study, uh, down to maybe 200 or so, uh, and then may perhaps ending up with 25 to 50 loci uh, when they're at the end of it. Uh, when they actually did this study, they ended up with about five or six loci. So replication is key. Uh, it's important that the initial study, one of the things we, we recognized in, in the working group, was you have to have enough description in the initial study to be able to replicate it. And many times, these genome-wide studies are, are very, very poorly described. Um, one of the, the studies of Crohn's disease famously described its cases as Belgian, and, and that's all. You know, and so it's, it's very difficult then to, to know how, how really to, to sort of try to replicate such a thing. Uh, participation rates and, and flow charts of selection would be very useful to have in, in order for an epidemiologist or others to know how selected a population is. Methods for assessing affected status very often are not described or just sort of it was a clinician, uh, you know, clinician's diagnosis. 
uh, table one sort of describing um, uh, cases and controls, how they compare on other factors, rates of missing data, uh, assessing population heterogeneity, genotyping methods, and quality control met metrics. Very often these, more and more they are coming uh, um, to, to be included in genome-wide reports, particularly because for our replication working group we had four journal editors as co-authors, so that, that helped a lot. Um, and then the replication study should have a similar population, a similar phenotype, the same genetic model, the same SNP in the same direction. Uh, it's amazing how some uh, replication studies, and I'll show you some tomorrow, um, didn't even find sort of the same allele or the same direction of association and still claimed replication. And then adequately powered to detect the postulated effect. So uh, how was this done in some of the, the genome-wide studies that are, that are out there? Um, one of the, the first in the, in the, or one of the earliest very big ones was this uh, uh, breast cancer study from the UK where they actually started with a very small, relatively small number of cases and controls, about 400 cases, 400 controls. But they selected them to be um, strongly familially loaded. So I believe these women had to have at least two relatives, first degree relatives with breast cancer. They tested 260,000 SNPs in them. Their stage two was 10 times as large, so 4,000 cases, 4,000 controls. 5% of their SNPs were carried forward into stage two. Stage three, you know, four times as large again, six times, sorry, as large again, um, brought forward only 30 SNPs, and then finally came out with uh, six um, SNPs that were, were significant across all of these studies. Um, and these are all of the cohorts that they used to get to their, you know, 40,000, 50,000 some subjects, so, so a huge, huge, huge um, uh, interaction, really a global collaboration. One of the things that's important to screen out too or make sure you don't miss are the false negatives shown here and now Edgar's gone, something's going on around here. So you want to be sure that you're not missing even subtle false negatives. Um, and the, the way this was approached in the CGEMS prostate cancer study was to take a larger number of cases and controls and more SNPs because they wanted to, you know, catch as many as they could. Um, but then basically took, uh, you know, 4,000 cases and 4,000 controls, so they modified their design a little bit. They brought forward 5% of their SNPs um, as the Easton breast cancer study had done. Um, and they selected everything at P less than 0.068. I've forgotten how they came to this. It was some fancy um, false positive report probability um, uh, parameter, but, uh, but at any rate. Uh, what's interesting is when they then did their, when they compared their sort of first and second stages and the way these studies are analyzed, they're often analyzed together in a joint analysis, correcting your p-values for that, that joint analysis. Um, here are the, the SNPs that came out and the genes that were associated, the p-values from stages one and two, but what's neat to look at is the initial rank from the stage one study. This particular SNP was, was ranked 24,000, so it was way, 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 way down. You almost didn't pull it up um, into, into the 26,000 that were tested. And similarly, these other SNPs that were strongly positive, you know, one of them was just above, uh, sorry, just below um, that, and, and several of them were, were not in, in certainly near top 100. Um, so, and the initial p-values even, you know, only this one was even on, probably on anybody's radar screen. Uh, so recognizing that it is easy to miss important associations as well. Um, and again, these, you know, these need further replication and further investigation, but it is sort of a, a, a harsh lesson, I think, uh, that if you just carry forward your top 100 SNPs, you may be carrying forward all your genotyping error and, and not a whole lot else. Um, Tom asked me to comment a bit about genome-wide association cohort studies. Um, this is beginning to be done in, in cohorts that have been prospectively collected, uh, people either free of disease or population-based samples with and with, without disease, however, you know, they, they may come, and exposures measured over time, uh, particularly in the Framingham study. You may have seen this report in BMC Medical Genetics. Uh, this is the sort of the cover paper that describes the 100-case uh, uh, SNP genotyping uh, study resource, and then there were 17 uh, phenotype working groups group reports published in the same, uh, the same issue. Um, and the Framingham has undergone 500K genotyping, and that's available in the Framingham. It's called the SHARE resource. I've forgotten. SNP, something, SNP Health Association resource, I believe, um, is what it stands for. Those data are also available through DB SNP, um, uh, sorry, DB GAP, uh, through a controlled access process. And the um, um, women's uh, health study, which is the, one of the Harvard uh, women's uh, cohorts, has also had a genome-wide association study done in 25,000. These are uh, these women were nutritionists, dietitians, and physical therapists. I think they were health professionals, but uh, but non uh, not nurses. So, and these uh, data will also be made available through a controlled access process. This is the dbGaP sort of entrance page. Um, database of genotype and phenotype was developed by the National Center for Biotechnology Information. 
um, <clears throat> in, in sort of recognition that uh, genome-wide association was coming, that these data needed to be made available in a, in a way that could be managed responsibly and still be accessible. And so it was developed basically as the Framingham resource and the GAIN study, which I was involved in, uh, Genetic Association Information Network, were moving forward. We kind of developed together, uh, developed policies and, and developed the resource. And you can see that uh, um, this may not be the latest screen screenshot from here, but Framingham Share is certainly on this. If you click on it, and I don't have a screenshot from Framingham Share, but uh, go going down to the ADHD study, which I know a little bit better, there's a description of the study that actually can go on for, for quite some time. This is a, a syllabus or a summary of it. You can search within for various things. You can also um, look at, at particular variables, uh, details or Vs are for variables, D I think for, for data that's available, et cetera. Um, you can also uh, ask for um, uh, information on how to apply for individual level data, and if you have an, an ERA access number at NIH, you're eligible to apply. Uh, any, anyone who has submitted a grant should have an ERA number. Um, you have to get certain credentialing through your institution in order to get such a number, and we felt that that was kind of the best way of credentialing a, a, a requester um, so that we didn't have, you know, kids in garages requesting data and that. It's not that hard to get an ERA number. Um, there, there are some steps that you have to go through, and so if you don't have one and you want access to these data, it is, it is possible to get one, but it is a, a, a bit more of a credentialing step. Um, and then there are sort of, you know, how, how one gets to these and what the use restrictions might be on a given data set so that you're aware of those. And then, uh, and then maybe just to, to finish up, and we'll let you out a little bit earlier on this, on this lovely day, um, genetic association and clinical trials. There has not been as much work done in clinical trials on, on genes and genetic association, certainly not as much as has been done in observational studies, even though most of that was candidate gene work. Um, uh, some interesting stuff that, that came out in 2000, uh, the year 2000, uh, on beta adrenergic receptor polymorphisms in response to albuterol and asthma, showing a, a really pretty profound association with a particular variant, the 16 arginine glutamine uh, variant, um, associated with actually worsening pulmonary function if you had the variant allele. Um, TCS7 polymorphisms, the F2 um, polymorphisms, this is that variant in diabetes uh, that I mentioned earlier, it has been typed in the diabetes prevention program. The diabetes prevention program was that clinical trial that looked at um, um, incidence of diabetes in pre-diabetics, so people who had elevated blood sugar or, or uh, impaired glucose tolerance or obesity. Um, in, in three arms, they were randomized to uh, physical activity, I believe, increased physical activity and diet control, metformin, and then sort of uh, uh, health advice, and uh, showed, showed that the, the uh, increased physical activity and, and weight control actually was, was the most effective there. And in fact, the TCF7L2 and a couple of other genes have been genotyped in that um, study showing basically that the, the um, um, interventions work differently in some genotypes, not for TCF7L2, but for some of the others. And it's, it's a nice way, actually, to make use of, of clinical trial information to see if you can find variants that, uh, that, that uh, affect or uh, interact with various treatments. Um, and this was also done in the All Hat study, um, this paper from Borwinkle and Arnett and, and their colleagues, uh, looking at, the, at a variant in, I've forgotten what MPPA is, but, uh, but at any rate, this was just recently published in January of 2008, um, and it is, again, a way of, of uh, looking at making use of clinical trials that have DNA um, uh, available to test uh, genetic associations. Um, there really have been only two that, that we could find genome-wide association studies in clinical trials, one being this very small one uh, looking at hepatic adverse events, elevated transaminases uh, in people who, re who received um, an anti-clotting agent called Zymolegatron. Uh, which reminds me of sort of a transformer name, but, uh, but at any rate, uh, was associated with uh, one of the MHC um, uh, DRB1 alleles. Uh, but when you look at, at what their data consists of, it seems to me that, boy, this is just begging to be a false positive, but, you know, it needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be uh, replicated. Um, and then a second one, uh, a little bit more robust, perhaps, uh, in looking at uh, response to interferon beta therapy in multiple sclerosis uh, and showing an association with a, with a particular variant. So to sum up then, um, candidate genes uh, association studies uh, have been enormously prone to spurious associations and have, uh, I think, uh, re received some, some um, uh, appropriate uh, uh, skepticism because of that. Genome-wide association really provides a new paradigm unconstrained by our current imperfect understanding of the genome. Um, initial findings have been really surprisingly positive. You know, sometimes we sort of pinch ourselves, or are we, are we awake? Um, but they are, they're robust, they're replicated, and, and now, you know, some, some important uh, aspects of biology are coming out of these, so they're probably real. 
Uh, it's beginning to be applied in cohort studies. That more needs to be done in, in that, and very little work has been done in clinical trials and, and treatment response. So uh, uh, I think one, one of the key lessons from this is that we need to get epidemiologists, clinical trialists, and geneticists together. And uh, it's my closing, uh, Gary Larson, what have I always said? Sheep and cattle just don't mix. And you can see they're having trouble here. So, so I think I'll stop at that point and be happy to take any questions. Uh, why, why don't you go first? Good. Oh, yes, you need your microphone. Yep, you turned it off. Linda, we're going to give you an alternative career here. <laughs> Is it? So, Larry, are we? Uh, can we turn our microphone on, or just a second? Up oh, there, you go. Uh, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly about genome-wide associations and, and twin cohorts. Um, is, is it that uh, you know, in, in, a, in a co-twin design, you sort of toss out the uh, exposure concordant twins, and the only thing that 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 uh, uh, lends to the association of the, the exposure discord twins. Um, so if you take uh, exposure concordant twins and, disease, and then they're disease discordant, does that sort of speak to a genetic it, it may, if you're talking about monozygotic twins? Monozygotic, okay, yes, so, absolutely. So exposure concordant? Disease discordant. Disease discordant. Yeah, so now it's like it sort of adds an interesting spin to the co-twin design because like mm -hmm. usually we, we think about monozygotic twins as, you know, the, 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 the association is adjusted for genes, right, monozygotic twins because mm -hmm. they're matched. But now I'm not sure you're saying that with, with this epigenetic stuff, they're looking for um, changes in the genetics. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, if you have exposed in, in a twin pair, if they're both, both exposed, one gets the disease, one doesn't. Mm -hmm. There must be some genetic change in the other. Well, no, I mean it could be if if you have exposure concordant twins, and right, you assume right. that the yeah the exposure is exactly the same in, in both of them. Is that exposure then doing something to their genomes in a different way? I guess right, is what we're right. what we're asking. And you know I'm I'm not sure I'd I necessarily put the constraint of matching on the exposure since it's so difficult to do anyway. It's right. sort of ideal. But epigenetic changes happen in, in ways, you know, the, the, they, they generally are methylation changes, and so they're thought to be related to sort of dietary folate and that, but nobody knows really how they come uh, about and where they, they go. And so maybe it's, the, you know, both twins smoke and one of them, you know, has an, an epigenetic modification from somewhere else. Something that, else, yeah. Right, that would cause them, maybe their glutathione transferase gene is turned on in one twin, which is important in, in metabolism and nicotine. It's turned on in one twin and turned off in another twin. So that might be a design, you're right, for, for finding some of those genetic variants um, that, that, you know, are not on the sequence, not the sequence itself, but something related to the sequence. But there's also a lot of other variability right. in there to try to tease out. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, twin, twin studies are challenging, but there are there's, real opportunities there, and, and we shouldn't just discount them. Recognizing, too, that even dizygotic twins, you know, they're, they're matched for age, which is great. They're matched for a lot of exposures, and, and you know, half the time they're matched for sex, so, so that's cool. Sir? I have two questions. Okay. Why is this really stupid question? Just no, show my ignorance. But then let me ask a non stupid question. <laughs> well, um, recently we, we received some, uh, well, sort of a, a questions uh, from the HRBI project officer was to reconsider. I'm sure they were brilliant questions. No, no, no. This is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> to reconsider. Oh, you just showed that uh, for this uh, genome wide uh, association study or, or different cohort study. Uh, you know, like share or, mm -hmm. or care, they plan to put on the web. I mean, so people uh, can apply and and uh, mm -hmm. to do the analysis and so. On. So one of the thing issue that the concern a lot of the investigator is the confidentiality. Sure. And uh, in the past, we received a letter from that office uh, saying this is not a human not human subjects research issue. Right. But mm -hmm. now it sounds like uh, uh, there is uh, some different uh, consideration on that uh, that. They consider this uh, letter is no longer valid. Um, you know that that letter has been very controversial from the beginning. So, so this was something that was put out by the Office of, of uh, Human Research Protections in oh. August of 2004, um, and it was their finding that, that basically, if data are de-identified, and one can debate as to what de-identified is, but what they their definition of de-identified was the 18 hip identifiers, which is you know age and birth date and stuff like that. Um, if if those were off, then this was not human subjects research. Now that was a 
the guidance that was put out to IRBs. And it really was up to an IRB as to whether or not to accept that guidance. Most IRBs have accepted it and have basically said this is not human subjects research. The institutes at NIH or elsewhere can't tell an IRB what to think and how to, how to act. Um, some institutes have asked the IRBs, are you sure, you know, do you really feel that this is human subjects research or it's not human subjects research or whatever? But others have, have just accepted whatever an IRB says. So I'm not sure what question you got back from. Well, uh, uh, ours is uh, saying that there is not human subject uh, issue, so they actually approve, have administrative approval uh, rather than going through the whole panel. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think it's important too not to, not to, um, perceive or, or portray what's going on in dbGaP as posting the data on the web, because it's not that. Um, what, you know, what's posted on the web is a description of the study. The data still have to get, you have to go through a fairly complex process in order to receive them, and you have to agree to keep them secure and to maintain confidentiality and, and not send them to anybody else, not try to identify anybody, and there are, you know, some fairly significant sanctions for for not doing that, that have to do with your relationship with the NIH. I mean, there's, you know, people could sue you and that sort of thing, but it's, it's much more a matter of if, if NIH were to find out that you had misused these data, you'd never get any more, that's for sure. And, and you probably have some difficulties with other aspects of interactions with NIH. So. Now the stupid question. <laughs> well, um, uh, what the genome-wide association studies, sometimes you just identify the region, right? The region that's associated with uh, certain disease and so on. Mm -hmm. I remember last year in science, I think they, there are five studies, uh, they uh, confirmed that they show certain reading that's associated with MI, like uh, the risk increased by 23% or something. Mm. I think uh, you're gonna go with the, the obesity one. I'm not sure about the with the. Yeah, I, I forgot yeah. the exact, but I wonder if you identify a pretty narrow region, why can't you just identify the genes? I mean, the, well, just, you know, some just regions. Just the bullet and do it. Do it uh, oh, sure, and, and you know, and, and in some regions that you identify, there there's just one gene, and isn't that wonderful? And you say, oh, there's just one. It must be like I showed you there, the you know, the IL 23R. Oh, that must be it. Well, yeah, but you know, we also know that there are some regions where there aren't any genes, and you've got an association. So maybe it's something about the way that region interferes with the way something else happens in the genome, or there are regions that have two or three genes, and I'll show you an example of that um, uh, tomorrow. And so, so, you know, trying to really figure out which, which variant it is that's causing, causing your, your phenotype is a real challenge. And so you, you go through various steps of, of trying to, you know, identify what's in the neighboring region, what's, in, what's it in linkage to equilibrium with, is it conserved across species, so does, did evolution somehow think it was important to keep it the same? And, and if so, it's heavily conserved, that suggests that it's pretty important. Um, and then there are other ways you can knock it down. You can sort of give uh, an interfering RNA and see what effect it is. Uh, if, you, if you reduce the function of that, you can see if it's expressed. There are a variety of ways of, of testing that, which I'm not a molecular geneticist, so I can only, you know, kind of skim the surface of that for you. But we'll, we'll go into that a little bit tomorrow. I, uh, I think you are already familiar with uh, the Korean genome epidemiology study. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, it, it was a very big study and it's it still ongoing. We already collected uh, uh, for more than 200,000 people, but it is still ongoing. And last four, uh, several years, we had lots of debates about the study design. Mm -hmm. And most was the focus of uh, the uh, sample size and uh, what kinds of phenotype we have to measure. But I think we had a uh, little uh, attention about the representativeness of a study population. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, some of the centers uh, are recruiting uh, court members from uh, health screening centers and even from the, some hospital because it is easier and sure. cost less. But uh, I'm not sure there about the representativeness about uh, our Mm -hmm. uh, general so can you explain a uh, little more about the uh, uh, importance of uh, representativeness of the general epidemiology study yeah well you're, you're probably in the in the center of of, uh, <laughs> of places who know about representativeness and the importance of it in epidemiologic studies I, I think I could comment on it for genome-wide association studies it, it doesn't seem to be quite so critical, at least for the genetic variants we found to date, because they, they seem to be, you know, usually what you expect, either you miss a whole bunch of stuff because you bias yourself toward the null, or you find a lot of spurious things because it's biased, and yet, you know, the, the one study that I think we, we would all have said, don't do
do it this way was the Wellcome Trust case control study where they, they used um, uh, blood donors basically as part of their controls. And then the 58, 1958 birth cohort, um, sort of the survivors of, of that birth cohort as the other half of their controls. None of them you know, were in the same cities and the same places as their cases and they hadn't been ascertained in the same way and probably that's why they didn't find an association with hypertension because hypertension was likely very common in the controls as well and they hadn't phenotyped their controls. And yet the associations that they found have been replicated again and again and again. So maybe if all you're looking at is that DNA sequence, maybe it's not so bad, but once you want to get out into either understanding gene function or understanding you know, gene environment interaction and how those associations are modified, how they change over the lifespan and that, I think you're, you know, you're sunk with a study like that. So, so that's where representative helps you. We're going to talk about um, some of the issues of bias, which the non-representativeness of the cohort could be uh, any one of a, a bunch of them. But um, I agree with um, with Terry that at, at the current, um, it's been amazingly robust to identify uh, some of the um, of the polymorphisms as it was. But I think if you were to like you're doing with a study that large you'd have the opportunity to have the power to look at quite a robust view of the genetic causation of diseases. Kind of what um, my, my reading of literature is, is that we've been kind of skimming uh, across the causative genes and identifying the, perhaps the prevalent and, and um, large odd ratios one. And the, the more, um, usually what the bias does, as you all know, is, um, is null, uh, bias toward the null. So your sensitivity to find all of the genes may be hindered or maybe even made spurious by a non-representativeness. So the, um, as we go through and look for the, the first cut major genes, I agree with Terry that there's been um, amazingly uh, uh, non-sensitive to mm. bizarre groups being compared. But I wonder if we really want to get down to saying this is really what the whole biology of this disease is and down to some of the very small polymorphisms that you're going to need to get to some of the, those more um, large and elegant and well-represented studies. Mm. I mean, you know, I think it's a it's, it's a real cr sort of creative tension, and, and when you talk to the Wellcome Trust folks, you know, who, who designed this study and that, they, they did it at a time, this had not been done before. I mean, they, they really, you know, there was the macular degeneration study, and that was basically it, and they, they just wanted to find something. You know, they, they sort of said, we don't want to find it all, we don't we even want to find a majority, we just want to find something, and, and they, they, you know, achieved that. 